Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ceres Power SOEC Investor Presentation. Throughout this presentation, attendees will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just please simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Me Company dashboard and we'll notify you by email when they're ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll, and if we could ask you to give that your kind attention, we would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand over to Elizabeth Skerritt, Director of Invest Investor Relations at Ceres Power. Good afternoon to you. Hello, and uh, welcome to today's session on Ceres' Solid Oxide Electrolyzer, or SOEC technology. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Elizabeth Skerritt, and I look after investor relations. We're really pleased to have so much interest in this new growth area for the business, and wanted to take the opportunity to take you through the landscape of electro uh, electrolysis technology, where our technology fits within this, um, the commercial strategy around growing this new business, and the relevance of intellectual property we have grown and have deployed already, and how we're deploying the electrolysis through the same business model. Um, joining our CEO, Phil Caldwell, and CFO, Richard Preston, today are Mark Selby, our Chief Technology Officer, and from Vancouver, our Chief Commercial Officer, Tony Cochran. We also wanted to take the opportunity to introduce you to some of the core team members who are delivering this electrolysis program. Director of eFuels, John Harmon, Clarissa Diego, our General Counsel and Director of Intellectual Property, and Deepak Mystery, our Commercial Lead for SOEC. Uh, this should take around an hour, leaving plenty of time for Q&A, so please do submit questions at any point during the presentation. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Phil. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, done the introductions, so I'm going to get straight in. Um, as Elizabeth said, we've got about an hour today, and today is really an opportunity to hear from the wider team. And I'm very pleased that we've got a team around this virtual table, which has just totting it up over 80 years of experience in the hydrogen and fuel cell industry. And just as a bit of a scene, scene setter for us, um, we did take the strategic decision late last year, backed up with the fundraise in March this year, to really expand and grow Sarah's power as a business, all around this purpose of addressing uh, climate change, particularly technologies for the hard to abate sectors. And I'm very often asked, why are we taking this step now? Why do we feel this time is right for hydrogen and fuel cells? And for many of us, we've been in the industry for almost 20 years. It does feel very different now. I just want to take a second to reflect on why I believe that is. So I think there's, there's three key elements which I think create this uh, almost a perfect storm for this kind of technology right now. We've got policy decisions being made globally. We've got disruption of major industries and we've got uh, green investment now flowing into this sector. So just on the first one, uh, we've now got over 20 countries globally with firm policies towards hydrogen and decarbonization. And that's in some of the leading economies of the world, like Japan, South Korea, Germany, China, uh, and the wider EU. And what's very uh, encouraging for us with Sarah's having been in this business for 20 years this year, we have relationships in most of those key uh, geographies. So that policy is, 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 is shifted, I would say, in the past two years like never before. We're also seeing disruption of major industries like the automotive industry facing electrification, uh, power generation and utilities being disrupted by the falling cost of renewable energy. And major corporations now having to deal not just with this disruption, but also having to pledge towards their net zero policies for the future, including oil majors like BP, Microsoft, and partners like Bosch. So this disruption is, is irreversible, it's, it's happening towards uh, this net zero goal. And finally, that creates a huge opportunity for investment. We're seeing more and more focus on sustainability and the ESG agenda, meaning there's, there's capital flowing in into the wider sector and also into companies that 
um, potentially can exploit this huge market opportunity that we're going to talk about today. And I think timing is everything when you're growing a business. And I think the time is right now for Sarah's. And we, you know, we've been doing this for quite some time and I'm very proud of what we've achieved in recent years. And I do believe that Sarah's has firmly established ourselves as, as one of the world leaders in this solid oxide technology. And just if you think about Sarah's purpose, our purpose is to um, address climate change. And we can only ad address climate change if we now tackle some of the really hard to abate, hard to decarbonize areas of society. And that includes the buildings that we uh, live and work in. That includes how we move around transportation and uh, goods and people. And that also includes decarbonization of industry. Now, Ceres historically has come from stationary power and we started at, at small scale stationary. And in recent years, we've been going up in power. Now with recent uh, partnerships with the likes of Bosch and, and Doosan, getting up towards utility scale um, deployment of technology. So we're very well established on the, on the power side for, for the commercial buildings and, and the built environment. In recent years, we've also expanded into transportation. Again, hard to abate areas like commercial vehicles, heavy duty vehicles with our relationship with Wei Chai, and more recently with our relationship again with Doosan, getting into things like shipping. And, and again, that's another sector that society has to get to grips with now if we're gonna hit these net zero targets for 2050. And finally, with the step we've taken earlier this year, we're now focusing on decarbonization of industry. And that is a significant opportunity for Sarah's, and that's what we're gonna focus on mainly in today's discussion. And that's really about hydrogen as one of the pathways to decarbonize things, particularly in industry like uh, green steel, green ammonia, and future fuels, e-fuels for, let's say, aviation and shipping. So this is entirely consistent with our purpose um, we've been doing this for quite some time, and it now feels like the right time to apply that sector-leading technology into this new area for electrolysis. And I mentioned, uh, to back this up, we did raise um, 180 million, or just 10% of our issued share capital in March. And the reason we did that is we saw that as a huge opportunity to grow the business, more than double the addressable market for our technology. Um, and just a reminder of the use of funds on that, about 25% of that is to grow the core business that we have today on the fuel cell power side. And that's into higher power, that's into new future fuel capability, hydrogen compatibility, ammonia compatibility for the future. And underpinning all of that is a um, investment also in the SOEC side of about 55% or so about 100 million over the next five years is what we're going to. Uh, put into this new area of electrolysis because we see the significant growth and that's the, the focus we're going to uh, talk to uh, this afternoon. And then the last part is what I would call foundational for the business. Um, it's how do we stay ahead? How do we continue to um, innovate and actually accelerate innovation in this area, maintain our technology leadership and provide the general work and capital that a, a larger company like Sarah's needs to operate with some of the the larger players in the industry, like Bosch, like Weichai, like Doosan. I'm very pleased to say that um, both strategically and financially, our two major partners in, in Weichai Power and Bosch were fully supportive of this strategy and also fully supportive uh, as part of that, that capital raise. And we also had strong investor backing. So that's enough for me from an overview. I'm now going to hand over to Mark Selby, CTO, to start to take you into more detail into the solid oxide electrolysis opportunity. Thank you, Phil. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm Mark Selby. I'm Chief, Technolo Chief Technology Officer. Um, and it, it's great to be here today. And I think one of the things that I'm really excited about is um, a few years ago, we made enormous progress on, on our fuel cell business and started to get the commercial traction we needed. And, and I and others in, in Sarah's realized that the sort of intellectual property and the human capital we've got presented a much bigger opportunity. 
And it's led us to where we are today with, with our purpose around clean energy for a clean planet. And so when we look at this from a technology point of view, not all technologies can do this, but the solid oxide technology that we've developed runs equally well in both directions as a fuel cell and as an electrolyzer, as we're going to talk about in some, some detail. So when you put this in, in the context of the energy system, and particularly the transition that we're going to go through over the next uh, 20 to 30 years, you're going to need technologies that convert fuels to electricity very efficiently. A fuel cell is the most efficient way of doing that known to physics. You're going to need to be able to store energy. And less obviously, you're going to need to find a way of turning renewable energy, renewable electrons particularly, into chemicals to decarbonize industry. And we're going to talk about some of those options for decarbonizing industry later. But when you put these three things together, you very quickly realize that technologies like electrolysis, and particularly the Ceres technology, uh, spans the whole energy transition. And that's for us, is hugely exciting, but it's hugely important uh, when, you can, when you connect that to our actual mission. One of the things that I think is really important for this journey, and one of the things that gave us the confidence to take this step, um, both from the sort of deep R&D program, but also the connection and the fundraise that Phil's just talked about, is we have an extremely mature point of departure. Um, when you put this in, in context, the same core technology works in both directions. That's great. That means that the same manufacturing processes, the same IP portfolio, um, some of the same partners we're working with, all are relevant to the journey we're, we're going to go on. When you think about fuel cells and electrolyzers, uh, and John Harmon will talk about this in much greater detail later, a fuel cell takes hydrogen and turns it into steam, and an electrolyzer takes steam or water and turns it into hydrogen. So at some point in that cell, in that stack, uh, the same atmospheres are present, the same materials, the same temperatures. And so there's a, a deeply mature technology from the fuel cell world, creating a huge opportunity in the electrolysis world, and it also stimulates innovation. Whenever you start to look doing something slightly differently, it creates opportunity for innovation and growth and new opportunities. So we're starting with something very mature, and we're excited about what it does for our business proposition as a, as a source of intellectual property. And uh, one of my colleagues will talk about that also later. Where does electrolysis fit and where does green hydrogen fit in, in this space? I, mean, I think lots of people are talking about hydrogen today and it's, it's, it's not a new topic, but I think precisely where hydrogen fits in and where it's gonna be most important is in, in our, my opinion, not, not well understood and is uh, in some areas, I think it's very predictable and in some areas it's less well predictable. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but I just want to take you through um, this chart, which is from a, a document that the Royal Society published about ammonia. And we've, we've slightly tweaked it, but it's essentially a Royal Society uh, picture that helps understand the connection between renewable energy and green chemicals. And I'm just going to start off on the right-hand side of this picture. Now, clearly in the middle there, you've got hydrogen. It's useful and valuable in its own right. But what's less obvious is that green hydrogen could all also, uh, through processes like the Harbour-Bosch process, be used to create green ammonia. Now today, green ammonia would go into the fertiliser industry and it would be a way of decarbonising uh, some of our agrochemicals processes. To put that in context, ammonia accounts for somewhere between 1% and 2% of primary energy. Um, so that's a big opportunity. And that's a growing opportunity because it also looks like ammonia is going to be a very relevant fuel for decarbonizing things like shipping. So it's both a chemical and it's a fuel. So hydrogen, electrolysis, fuel cells, and now it's an intersection of pure energy system, the way we think about it, but also chemicals plastics and all sorts of things that we think about in our everyday lives and maybe don't understand the sort of provenance of all the things that go into them. But we can also think about things like e-fuels. How do I take uh, CO2 that I might catch from the air and turn it into jet fuel? Well, if you want to do that, you can do that. There's a process called Fischer-Tropsch, 
um, where you can take hydrogen, you can mix it with carbon dioxide and you can turn it into kerosene for, for decarbonizing aviation. If you want green hydrogen, if you want to start with your primary energy being electricity and renewable electricity, um, you need an electrolyzer. And there are many electrolyzer technologies, and I'll talk about a, a, the, a few of them in a minute. But one of the key things that separates high temperature electrolysis, our solid oxide electrolysis technology, is the ability to recover and incorporate process heat. Now, many of the processes we've just talked about for creating ammonia uh, or uh, synthetic fuels also produce heat in that journey. So if you can recover that heat back into your hydrogen, you're lowering your primary energy demand. That's really important. The only way we get to net zero is both to take carbon out of the system and reduce our consumption. So technologies that are efficient and clean and zero CO2 are central to the transition. So just going back a second to um, slightly deeper understanding of technology and technology maturity importantly, I think when people think about electrolysis, then I'm not sure they know what an electrolyzer looks like. Um, and if you think about alkaline technology, which is undoubtedly the most mature, you're thinking about large industrial processes. Uh, a lot of it has been developed from the chloralkali industry, which is a very big industry globally and in the UK. The largest uh, consumer of electricity in the UK is an alkaline electrolyzer in Runcorn that's used for the chloralkali process. So very mature, around for 100 years, works very well, um, works up to about 68% efficiency, loves running very stably. When you start to think about how the energy system is going to change, intermittency and renewables are going to be really important. And that presents a really interesting opportunity for PEM electrolysis technology. It's very dynamic. It's similarly efficient. It's maybe a little bit less mature for alkaline, but it's out there being commercialized today. And it creates additional value streams through being able to integrate with the energy system and provide those grid balancing services through that dynamic response. Solid oxide electrolysis is probably newer, but it is fundamentally differentiated because of very high efficiency that it enables. If you start from water, that's about 74% efficiency, but if you have steam or uh, process heat, it can go all the way up to 95% efficiency. I'm just going to look at that in a little bit more detail. So on here, we've got low temperature technology, PEM and alkaline, and we've got the high temperature solid oxide that we're talking about. And on this scale on the bottom, we've got a few measures of, electric, uh, of efficiency. So kilowatt hours of electricity to kilograms of hydrogen. Or if we think about hydrogen as a fuel, we can think about it in terms of a, an electrical efficiency. And there's a couple of questions around here. The first thing is, we can see there's a differentiation between these low temperature technologies and the high temperature technologies. And there's a question, of, is that just to do with uh, good catalysis? Is it a function of good engineering? Or is it something deeper? Well, it turns out that the difference in efficiency between those low and high temperature technologies is a fundamental thermodynamic advantage. Now, you have to do the engineering well, and the engineering is challenging, and that's why it's an interesting and valuable problem for a company like Ceres to work on. But there is, no, there is no chance that lower temperature technologies can be as efficient as higher temperature technologies. And so this differentiation is really important. And further, what you can see here on the top right is, if you've got steam, it becomes more efficient. If you've got higher grade heat that you might get from particular industrial processes or even nuclear, you can get to extremely high uh, electrical efficiencies. Why is that interesting? Well, if all my primary energy is coming from investments in wind turbines and solar PV, I, I need less wind turbines. I maybe need 10 wind turbines for a PEM system or a, an alkaline system, but I only need seven wind turbines for an SOEC system. So when you start to think about land use, when you start to think about the investment in the upstream energy system, you start to think about the value of that energy in its own right. It's really important in the way it flows through into uh, the cost structure of a kilogram of hydrogen. I'll, I'll introduce that in a minute, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to it in more detail later. <coughs> so where have I come from? I've, I've told you we've got an interest in technology. I've told you how it fits into the market. I've said there's an advantage. 
And this chart is uh, going to tell you where we think that demand is going to come from. This is a chart from a great report by the Energy Transitions Commission. And it, it lays out uh, where hydrogen will be consumed in a 2050 scenario that's hit that one and a half degree target. Uh, and so what you've got on the X here in the middle is uh, megatons of hydrogen produced or consumed by those different industries. And on the right, you've got a, a certainty of hydrogen's role in that future. And I think what is not well understood in the hydrogen space at the moment is some of the areas for hydrogen that we're talking about least, the very hard to abate sectors, are high value chemicals, things like ammonia, things like steel, things like heavy transport, are the areas where we have the highest certainty. The reason we have a high certainty in those areas is because there are no other technologies that meet the levels of decarbonisation required at a credible cost point. So hydrogen is going to be one of these technologies that solves problems that other technologies are simply not able to. If we put some numbers around that, those three, four, five hard to abate sectors for hydrogen demand are about 400 megatons of green hydrogen. If we put that into context, if we thought about converting all passenger cars uh, to hydrogen, for example, that would maybe be somewhere between 10 and 40 megatons. So we think about passenger transport as being a big sector, but when you think about it in hydrogen context and you think about it in an energy context, it's actually a very, very small part of the end state problem that we've got to resolve. So these hard to, de hard to abate sectors are billion person problems and they're hugely valuable. And because they plug into many different areas of the industry, it means it's a robust proposition. You, if you don't believe it's going to happen in steel, you probably are credibly, you probably believe it's going to happen in ammonia or shipping, but you, you can't believe that it's not going to happen in many of these. And I just wanted to, to put into context um, waste heat or heat that's not used efficiently or effectively by processes today. Um, I've taken a European study. Um, because it was, it, it's a good and it's a recent analysis of available waste process heat. Now, I've already said that if I can couple an electrolyzer with process heat, I can take some electricity and some heat and convert that into green electricity. Well, if I look at the available process heat across Europe and I looked how much electrical capacity I could couple that to in an electrolyzer, I end up with a number that is somewhere around all of the electricity used in a year in the UK, Spain, France, and Germany. Now, that's huge. I'm not suggesting for a second that we would capture all of that market, um, but it gives you some sense of the available opportunity of waste heat to couple to electrolysis. And if you look at this chart, you can look at the available temperatures of that heat. So on the left, it's basically low-grade steam, and on the right, you might be coupling it with some very sophisticated high temperature processes. But if you look at the efficiency that that turns into, it turns into over 95% efficiency. So huge opportunity, huge availability of process heat, and the lowest cost possible green hydrogen that you can make. <coughs> now I'm gonna introduce this number here. Um, we, we talked about this target of sub $1.50. And with our technology, if I take some very, very conservative assumptions of, say, $1,000 uh, a kilowatt of CapEx, 80% um, efficiency, $20 a megawatt hour, very, very conservative in our opinion about how the market's going to develop and what the technology is achievable, I can already get to that sub $1.50 a kilo of hydrogen in the middle part of this decade as commercialization starts. So whilst we can talk about efficiency and all the good things about decarbonization, we can also talk about highly differentiated cost structure that this technology enables. If you want to change the world at scale and pace, you can't do it on your own. So because this is the same technology that we're already licensing to many partners around the world today, this means we can leapfrog into, into this space very actively and make huge progress quickly by deploying our technology through existing manufacturing facilities as they choose to upgrade their licenses. It's central for this industrial problem. And it's also going to be extremely important in decarbonizing some of those heavy duty transport areas. So 
I hope this gives you a sense of why Sarah's is a so a so committed to this, as Phil's talked about from, from the start, but also so excited about the impact we can have on the transition that's about to happen. And to take you into the sort of execution of that program, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, John Harmon. Thank you, Mark. Um, good afternoon. So I'm John Harmon. Uh, I'm just going to move the slide. There we go. Um, I'm the uh, director of the eFuels program at Ceres, and I'm going to provide a little more information about our technology platform, what sets it apart and how it works, and then provide some details of how our SOEC technology development program um, and, and, and future roadmap. So uh, just a few words on, on the core technology. So, so we've developed a, a novel and mature and, and highly differentiated solid oxide cell technology based upon the use of low cost and abundant ceramic materials, which are then deposited upon a stainless steel substrate. Now, the unique thing about our technology, it uses ceria as the oxygen ion conducting ceramic within the cell. And this use of ceria allows our technology to operate at lower temperatures, typically between five to 600 degrees C than conventional solid oxide technology. Um, so we get all the advantages of that higher energy conversion efficiency from, from solid oxide technology, but those lower temperatures enable us to use much lower cost materials. So we get lower production costs for the cell itself, but also um, associated system costs are lower and balance of plant costs are lower, but also the lower operating temperature allows for much greater mechanical robustness in, in real world set settings. And actually our technology is now being used in motive applications as well because of this, because of this ability. So, the really compelling aspect of solid oxide technology is the ability to perform both as a fuel cell and an electrolyzer cell using the same base design. So as Mark alluded to earlier, in, in, in fuel cell mode, fuel such as hydrogen and natural gas or indeed ammonia um, and oxygen carried in by the air are then supplied to the cell. Um, and the cell then generates electrical power and steam as an as a exhaust product. And then in electrolysis mode, zero carbon electrical power and steam are fed into the cell and green hydrogen is generated. Uh, the oxygen which is generated on the other side of the cell is then swept away from the cell by using a gas, typically air, for example. So we are now extensively testing our solid oxide technology platform for use in steam electrolysis operation with really promising results. Uh, and the testing shows that the electrochemical and physical processes of the technology are equally efficient in both SOFC and SOEC mode, meaning there's really no major difference in performance or degradation at commercially relevant operating conditions. And whilst we see SOEC is a really rich area for innovation. We don't need any new technological breakthroughs for commercialization of our technology. Really the, the focus for the coming years is on maturing and optimizing the technology for SOEC operation. And again, one, one of the key advantages of solid oxide electrolysis is this ability to integrate with external process heat sources. What you can do, you can almost trade process heat with electrical power um, to really reduce the amount of electrical power required to produce the same amount of, of hydrogen, up to maybe 30% less than, than low temperature electrolysis. And I think it's worth making the point that because we operate at a lower operating temperature to, to other solid oxide technologies, it enables us to access and exploit that um, um, the waste heat, the, the industrial heat at lower grade temperatures. So we, we, we actually get access to a larger bucket of exploitable heat um, with our technology. Okay, so we we're not just testing our technology in the, in the laboratory. Um, 
we're now working um, very hard on producing our first of a kind demonstrator. So at the moment, we've got a one megawatt class SOEC system demonstrator under, under development. Uh, you can see it displayed here on the, on the slide. So this system is going to be packaged in a 40 foot ISO shipping container, and it's expected to produce approximately 600 kilos of green hydrogen per day. So each, so, well, the containerized system will be capable of accepting up to nine electrolysis cell modules. So you can see these in the foreground of the slide. Um, so each of those ECMs will contain an array of eight of our standard stacks, along with hot balance of plants, components such as heat exchangers and heaters. And this modular approach for this first of a kind system enables each ECM to be constructed and tested prior to installation at an initial pilot site. So for that first of a kind system, we're using our standard stacks, no changes in design uh, within the ECM. And those stacks are fully validated in SOFC mode, and they're currently being industrialized for, for high volume production with our strategic partners. Now we're developing this first system using a minimum viable product approach. So really we're just putting enough features in that first system to enable demonstration to show to our early adopter partners how the system's going to work and validate this product idea early but of course in parallel we'll be optimizing and maturing the core cell stack and systems technology and again i think it's really helpful to have a a, a meaningful scale system up and running because we're going to get a huge amount of learning from using the technology at this scale so we're planning to deploy this first of a kind system at an initial pilot site next year. Um, and that pilot site will provide all the external interfacing systems to enable the demonstration. Um, so things like an industrial power supply, the steam supply, and the hydrogen, downstream hydrogen processing and, and compression systems. So just looking a little further forwards, um, so we actually initiated our SOEC development program back in 2019. Um, and since then, we've been conducting extensive testing on single cells, short stacks, and now tall stack platforms in our laboratories in, in Horsham. So this, the approach to the testing um, of the technology in SOEC mode has really been firmly grounded in the extensive work that we've accomplished in verifying our technology in SOFC mode over many years. And as I mentioned, we're now building a megawatt scale system prototype to be operational in 2022. That will allow our licensees and our partners to fully validate the, the, the performance, cost and operational flexibility of the technology at a really meaningful scale and a scale which can then be scaled up even more for, for commercial deployments. So from that first prototype system, we'll then be moving towards commercialization with our strategic partners across a range of market sectors that my colleague Deepak will go into in a bit more detail later. Um, with the first commercial systems being deployed from, from 2025. So over the next three years, we'll be optimizing and maturing the SOEC technology for product release in 2024. And this work will really be looking to drive down the hydrogen production costs, which Mark mentioned earlier, really through three main areas. So the first area will be we're, we're moving to mass manufacture of Serra stacks in any case. So that will really start to drive down the, the, the capex cost of the stacks. We'll be working on increasing our operating current density in SOEC mode, thereby increasing efficiency and lowering the system OPEX costs, the, the, the energy costs required to produce hydrogen. And finally, we'll be working really closely with our strategic partners to develop the supply chain for all the components needed for electrolysis systems and thereby driving down system CapEx costs as well. So to summarize, we're now applying our proven and unique solid oxide cell technology to electrolysis system applications for industrial green hydrogen production. 
We're going to demonstrate our technology at megawatt scale through a first of a kind prototype next year. In parallel, we're developing, maturing and optimizing the technology towards first commercial system deployments from 2025 and significantly higher efficiencies than other electrolysis technologies are possible, particularly when we look to integrate with industrial processes, with low pressure steam and, and process heat. And this enables a roadmap to green hydrogen production costs of less than $1.50 per kilogram of hydrogen. I'm now gonna hand over to my colleague Deepak, who's gonna take you through the commercial landscape in more detail. That's great, thanks, John. Just moving on the slide. Sorry, can I think? So hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Deepak Mystery, and I'm the commercial lead for our electrolyzer technology. I'm a new face at Ceres. I joined in January this year, having spent you know, two decades, over two decades, in primarily in the automotive sector. And in my time in the automotive sector, what I learned was that engineering clean transport solutions is no longer that challenging. What is a real challenge and a global imperative is to decarbonize energy to address climate change. And this is what excites me about the technology we are developing at Ceres. It is a potential game changer in the energy market. So what I'm going to talk about today is a significant electrolyzer market opportunity that we've touched on already in this presentation and our commercial strategy to extract value from this market. So just starting off, first of all, over the, over the past two decades, the business has done an incredible job in building a successful technology platform and licensing business model with some major manufacturing partners focused on the power market. This is the technology, this is technology operating as a fuel cell uh, for applications such as backup power for businesses, such as data centers, domestic power, and heavy transport. The opportunity we now have is to apply that same technology platform and business model to a much bigger hydrogen electrolyzer market in which hydrogen and hydrogen-based fuels are, only, are the only credible solution to decarbonize. And in this mode of operating, as shown to the right, the green hydrogen will service a huge range of applications. So as a feedstock, an industrial feedstock, for example, to refineries, uh, e-chemicals such as green ammonia and methanol, e-fuels for use in heavy transport, and also green hydrogen as a blended fuel uh, with natural gas to decarbonize domestic heating. And to capture surplus, also to capture surplus uh, renewable energy and store until required and then the power and when the power is required feeding it back through our technology operating as a fuel cell uh, in a fuel cell mode to generate power so an incredible opportunity to access a multi-million multi-trillion dollar market using a proven technology platform that is highly differentiated and coupled with an agile capital like and scalable business model so if we now take a look at the macro hydrogen market out to 2050, a timeline by which most major nations have committed to net zero targets, as you'd expect, we find a number of varying market projections ranging from two to 12 trillion US dollars for hydrogen gas and electrolysis equipment. And these are reports from the likes of BP, McKinsey and the Hydrogen Council uh, and Goldman Sachs. Now we all know that a lot can happen over four decades. So, so let's take those projections with a pinch of salt. But what is important to remember is that the order of magnitude is consistent. It's not a few billion, and equally it's not tens of trillions, but it is in the order of a few trillion dollars, and it's big. Now, the forecast you can see here is by McKinsey and the Hydrogen Council, which is at the conservative end of the spectrum. They projected growth in demand for hydrogen of approximately 50% in the next decade, and then from then on, the growth is, is, is expected to be exponential, with a market projected to be eight times bigger than it is today by 2050. That's roughly the market doubling every decade to 2050. And they estimate this is worth in the order of two and a half trillion dollars for hydrogen, gas and elect electrolysis equipment, of which approximately 50 percent, so 1.25 trillion, will be serviced by green hydrogen, from which we would be generating our royalty streams for equipment sales. Now we believe we are very well placed to target a significant portion of this market 
with a highly differentiated technology and scalable business model, working with our large manufacturing partners, and, and that you've heard earlier as well in the presentation. So which, which of these sectors underpin this growth projection? Well, the easiest way to summarize this market is to split it up into three equal approximate uh, quarter thirds. So the first third consisting of all the existing hydrogen users that need to switch to clean hydrogen to decarbonize. This is what we consider to be relatively low hanging fruit over the next decade. So ammonia for fertilizer production, methanol production, and for use in refineries. And in the latter part of this decade, we expect to see the steel sector and other heat, high heat industry, high heat, heat intensity industries to start to commercialize the use of hydrogen too. Now, another third of the market is accounted for by the heavy transport sectors in which hydrogen and hydrogen based fuels will play a significant role in decarbonizing heavy road transport and the marine sector. This means large vessels such as bulk carriers, container ships, cruise ships will all need to switch to an alternative fuel such as ammonia or hydrogen in the next decade. And as we touched on earlier, to produce ammonia, you need hydrogen. And then beyond 2030, we expect the heavy <clears throat> transport sector to start to use hydrogen based uh, synthetic fuels or e-fuels to power ships and airplanes as these fuels become more prevalent. And now the final third of clean hydrogen demand by 2050 is projected to come from the remaining market, such as building heat and power and storage of energy in the power generation market to manage energy from variable renewable energy sources. So to summarize the macro market out to 2050, this is the multi-trillion dollar market from which we will generate our revenue streams. The demand is diverse, which makes the market robust. And the growth is projected to be exponential, doubling every decade over the next, 20, over the next 40 years. So how are we going to commercially access this clean hydrogen market? First of all, the target sectors of our electrolyzer technology are those which will be the major producers and in some cases also the users of clean hydrogen. So this includes the oil and gas sector, the industrial gas sector and clean energy sector. In these markets, the private and public sector are already investing in, in early technology demonstration projects and forming partnerships, particularly those that need to transition away from green hydrogen in the, new, in the next 10 years, such as for ammonia production and for refineries. This is the low hanging fruit I, was men I mentioned earlier. And we are currently engaging with each of these target market sectors to develop a route to commercialization from 2025. So this includes a first of a kind demonstration that was mentioned by John earlier, and a range of market stimulation activities, including technical feasibility studies, techno-economic modeling, and small pilots to support each partner's respective due diligence processes. Now, along with the oil and gas and the industrial gas sectors, we are also engaging with the nuclear energy market, which is a strong potential fit with our electrolyzer technology, providing continuous electrical power and a source of steam and heat to generate hydrogen at high levels of efficiency. And to ensure our successful transition from this world of feasibility studies, pilots and demonstrations to full commercialization, we are laser focused on establishing the right partnerships that have the ambition and the scale and the global presence to be in a position to supply green, clean hydrogen to this multi-trillion dollar market. To enable this successful transition to commercialization, we're also focused on ensuring our manufacturing capacity with our partners ramps up in a timely manner to meet this demand. Announcements by Bosch and Doosan of building multi megawatt capacity plants by 2024 align very well with the demand for initial commercial megawatt class projects from 2025. So a smooth transition. Furthermore, as the technology is integrated into a range of applications and processes, the next five to 10 years also presents us with a great commercial opportunity to generate a rich set of integration IP that will form part of our future success. So in summary, we are targeting gas production, gas producing sectors, in a, and in particular, those that will transition away from grey hydrogen over the next decade as an initial target. We plan to build initial commercial systems from 2025, and we're ensuring our partner-based supply chain scales to meet this demand from 2025. 
So what does this macro timing look like uh, for this market? Well, if we look at this in terms of the production cost of hydrogen per kilogram, as Mark introduced earlier, a market inflection point is expected in the, in the next decade when green hydrogen becomes competitive with grey. This market inflection point will be driven by several factors, including increasing availability of renewable energy, the maturity of electrolyzer technology, and the centralized production of hydrogen. And by this time, the ratcheting costs, costs of carbon will also make grey hydrogen commercially uncompetitive. So over the next decade, the majority of the hard to abate market will be going through a process of commercializing the use of clean hydrogen to decarbonize. And this coincides with the projected inflection point in the market in the next decade when clean hydrogen will become commercially competitive, leading to a scenario in which the demand for clean hydrogen is expected to increase exponentially over the following two decades. So on this macro time horizon, our market entry point shown here, with a commercialized electrolyzer electrolyze system will be in 2025, generating hydrogen at a target cost of less than one and a half dollars per kilo. And, th and through our R&D activities and to improve, the, to improve the integration and also the core platform technology, we expect to maintain a differentiated cost point against our competitors from there onwards. This means our technology pulls forward that inflection point of when green hydrogen is competitive with gray by at least five years and maintain a differentiated cost position from there onwards, which is, as you can see, a potential huge game changer. So to summarize, the electrolyzing market is significant and we're uniquely positioned to generate royalty streams from 50% of a predicted $2.5 trillion addressable hydrogen market by 2050. And we have a commercial strategy to engage early with the major gas producers to commercially deploy our technology from 2025 at a differentiated cost point and at a time uh, for a market projected to double every decade to 2050. I'm Tony Cocker, I'm not Clarissa de Jager, uh, but we will be hearing from her shortly at the Q&A. Um, I'll uh, share our insight on the intellectual property considerations for Ceres as it relates to SOEC. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the use of uh, solid oxide technology in electrolysis applications is, is not new. Um, it's a known application for the technology, and uh, we, we're obviously not an exception, as you've been hearing today. And the good news about that is that we've known its applicability for a very long time, and through our intellectual property filings uh, over the years we've been de developing solid oxide fuel cells, we have also considered the solid oxide electrolyzer applications as well. And therefore, our intellectual property portfolio is already very robust to the electrolyzer application, having benefited from all the legacy filings considering electrolyzer applications as well. And uh, therefore, um, even though we are entering the market um, near term now, um, over the decades that we've been working on this, the uh, electrolysis technology is covered by the majority of our intellectual property portfolio. And as Mark Selby said earlier, the uses of the technology and, and, the, and the chemistry that's being used, as well as the operating conditions, are very, very consistent with fuel cell mode. And uh, therefore, a lot of the intellectual property is inherently useful in uh, electrolysis applications as well. To put some numbers to that, um, the chart you see below is the filings that we've, that we've performed over the years. Uh, you'll notice, of course, that the uh, growth trajectory we're on has also enabled a growth trajectory of our intellectual property filings. Um, but the other thing that we have uh, focused on and will continue to focus on is the additional protection that we get from the, the trade secret portfolio as well. And recent, recent legislation in intellectual property has created a much stronger asset-based view of trade secrets and uh, we actually treat them as intellectual property assets, not too dissimilar to our patents. The main difference being 
difference being that we keep them secret. And in many regards, keeping certain things secret as opposed to publicizing them through patents actually strengthens and lengthens the time with which you, you have your protection. And uh, these technology assets are the ones that we tend to incorporate into the relevant licenses that we practice in our business. Um, our expectation is that on top of the overlap that we have with the uh, existing patents from SOFC, we will also, as John Harmon suggested earlier, be innovating around the bespoke conditions of the SOEC systems. And so innovation hasn't stopped there and it doesn't stop because there's a legacy portfolio. The innovation actually accelerates now in the SOEC domain to add SOEC specific uh, technology to enhance our existing patent and trade secret portfolio. So uh, the good news is we're very robust uh, from an intellectual property standpoint, and uh, we have a very, very strong springboard to continue our differentiated position in this very exciting field. Um, I'll now transition to how we exploit some of this intellectual property through the business model that we've chosen. For those of you less familiar with Ceres, um, we have chosen as a company not to build factories and large service organizations and all the complexity that results from trying to scale uh, a manufactured and industrialized product and position it in the market. We rely on our partners to do that, to digest that complexity. And we focus instead on a much lower asset-based business model which is primarily to license our technologies to partners who have the capability to industrialize products incorporating our technology and position them into the market. And what we do is we segment our, our licenses into um, buckets or segments, so to speak. And the most natural segmentation of our technology licenses tends to fall into the stack itself, which is the essentially the box that incorporates the cells that do the electrochemical conversion. And then the balance of plant or, 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 the, or the subsystems around the stack that get built into an end user solution, we call our system licenses. And uh, they, they ensure that the embedded stack technology is properly integrated and performs in, in a best in class manner. We extract royalties at both of these levels. Um, and the trend is, of course, that the stack that contains the, the base building block um, will be produced by certain types of OEM partners who have certain ceramics and manufacturing capability to produce that at scale, quality, and cost. And then the system partners who can procure the stacks from our, 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 our stack licensees um, they will be best in class at engineering the products around those stacks and positioning those into the relevant end use markets. And in the electrolysis market, we see this playing out in a very similar way. So we, we don't feel like we need to adjust our business model to access this very large electrolyzer opportunity. We actually believe that the factories that produce the stacks will still be some of the same kinds of factories that produce the electrolyzer stacks. And we believe that we can enable the systems partners to produce electrolyzer solutions around those stacks uh, and deploy those products successfully into the various applications that we've described so far. So no major adjustment to our business model. And uh, we, we believe that we can continue to practice our licensing model in very much the same way as, as, as we do today with our fuel cell practice. Uh, the progression, so how, how do we actually get our technology to market through our, our licensees? Well, they tend to follow a very uh, consistent trend. Um, we engage quite early with partners who are uh, market leaders, and uh, we start off by doing some joint product development. This is especially relevant to the systems partners who in many cases don't fully understand how to integrate our stacks and cells into systems. We embark on joint development programs with them uh, where we provide engineering services and IP licenses 
to some of our knowledge and practice in the system area. Um, then you transition once, once there is a product design that's been engineered and, and is robust, you transition to an industrialization phase, which usually involves building factories and, 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 and supply chains, and even in many cases, sales forces to support the, the product itself. That's done through our partners as well. Um, and we tend to we tend to gain fees for that tech transfer and that industrialization program as well. Um, and then the final step in the commercialization process is really just ramping up the production and, and sales of the product. Um, that's actually quite light in terms of its demands on Ceres. That's the point at which you harvest and, and extract maximum value through royalties. And uh, our role there is to make sure that the technology that's being sold is uh, is world class. It's differentiated, and in some cases, we we provide upgrade licenses to ensure those factories are competitive long term. And our our growth strategy on on the two types of licenses we practice can can be viewed um, in in sort of two streams. The, the left hand stream is how do we continue to create demand for Sarah's technology? And by that, I mean um, our, our technology revenues from royalties will grow with, with volume sales. And our objective is to make sure that we embed Sarah's technology into a maximum num number of channels that uh, allow the use of our technology and create the demand. And that's primarily done through our system licenses. And as you can see from the chart, over the years, we've been really expanding the applications where our technology provides that differentiated benefit. And we've migrated not only up in what we call the power level of the solutions, but we've also, across the, the columns, added significant new market verticals to the positioning of our products in the market. And SOEC is no different. Um, we obviously will be expanding on that column to, to describe specific applications within the SOEC market as we start growing that business as well. And uh, what this does is, is it offers, first of all, demand uh, for our stack licensees, but it also offers significantly lower risk to uh, market changes. So the more, the more segments of the market that we can access with our technology, the uh, lower the market risk for our stack licensees, which um, we, we are governed by the right-hand side. And so the right-hand side is just a depiction of some of the factories that we believe will exist for the stacks. And the good news is the partners that we have in SOFC um, will likely be able to sweat the same assets and use the same assets to produce SOEC stacks under new licenses from us should they choose. So as we build the demand for SOEC uh, applications embedding Ceres technology, we create a market for our existing licensees to upgrade their licenses, but also a market for new licensees who decide to enter the stack build business uh, in order to service the growing demand for Ceres stacks. And we believe that's incredibly powerful. Uh, it's obviously self-consistent and self-supporting. And... Uh, as these factories come online, we will also benefit from the global sales forces and sales channel of our stack licensee partners who will continue to enable the growth on the left side of this chart to expand their markets for the capital uh, capacity that they've put in place to produce the stacks. So it's a very reinforcing model. Uh, it doesn't involve a lot of capital from Ceres, and our role is really to try and enable a healthy demand supply relationship in the licenses that we commission with our various customers. And from a, from a revenue standpoint, um, the bright, bright purple is the trajectory that we've described in the past around our fuel cell market. And uh, as you can see, our, our revenue growth initially is governed by the first two phases in the partner relationships that I've described, which are joint development programs and some of the upfront license payments that have resulted from the contracts that we've put in place. And in around 2024, there'll be an inflection point when the factories come online towards 
the growth of our royalty streams, which are additive to some of our license fees and engineering services revenues. And we believe that the SOEC market will follow very much the same trajectory. Uh, we will um, near term be benefiting from joint development program revenue and upfront licensing fees revenue as people uh, take on licenses in the SOEC marketplace. And as, as the uh, commercial production begins, the royalty streams will, will kick in, which will not only be royalty streams for the, for the system license being practiced, but they will also be royalty streams for the incremental stacks that will be made available to the market. And uh, we believe that timeline is shorter than the one we embarked on in the fuel cell commercialization because of the existence of some of the supply chain of the stacks themselves, that, that, those, that's, that, that supply chain will already exist. And because we're building on uh, a fairly assured platform and therefore the progression on the maturity vector is actually more predictable, um, much lower risk, we believe, and therefore the adoption can happen more quickly um, as the market starts absorbing electrolyzer technology into the solution set uh, applied to decarbonization. Um, and so finally, I have the privilege of sort of trying to wrap up what you've heard today. Um, and first and foremost, the electrolyzer opportunity is inherently consistent with Sarah's purpose, which, which is really that clean energy mission that, that we all get up every day and, and embark on. And uh, we, we strongly believe that green hydrogen is a fundamental cornerstone of decarbonization. And really fortunately, we have an incredibly important role to play in enabling that decarbonization through offering really differentiated high efficiency electrolysis solutions to what's already a, a growing market for green hydrogen and the electrolyzers that will support it. Um, we really don't think that this adds significant complexity to our business. So adding this newer and much larger market vertical doesn't change what we do and is entirely complementary, both from a technology standpoint, but also from a, from a, from a commercialization and business standpoint, we don't need to hire new departments of people or create an entirely new overhead to digest this, this, this significantly increased access to market. And therefore it's, it's entirely consistent with our growth trajectory and doesn't offer significant incremental risk. Um, we believe that commercialization can happen more quickly than, than, than the fuel cell trajectory because of the de-risking that we've already done in the fuel cell side. So our model is tried and tested the industrialization is, is being digested now, and therefore we'll benefit from all those learnings and that learning curve, which significantly reduces market access risk. Um, and we, we believe that the revenues are, are additive and inherently complementary. In other words, the more, the more hydrogen that exists, the more interest there will be in our fuel cell assets and our fuel cell uh, licensed products. And similarly, the more fuel cell opportunities that exist, the more this whole theme of how do we use hydrogen will exist. And so uh, we, we really are encouraged by the complementarity of this technology to our existing business and the growth potential that it offers. So I'll end here. So thank you very much. I'll hand it over to uh, Richard Preston, who's going to lead our Q&A today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. And thanks for everyone for presenting. So we've got a good number of questions come through and uh, we'll try and answer most of them we, um, as much as we can. And my first question, it, um, I'm going to direct towards, towards Mark, and it's a question um, about um, waste heat. Um, could, you, um, could you give some examples of industries where heat's not normally um, reutilised? It's not obvious um, that these untapped sources of heat are available. Yeah, okay, good, good question. And, and actually in the slides, which I think we'll make available after, there, there is a reference that provides quite a lot of detail in a, in a, a journal paper on, on that, and that was the data we based it on. But to give you some examples, um, steel is a really good example 
of where you can't recuperate all of the heat that is put into the process. Um, we also talked a lot about things like the Harbour Bosch process for ammonia. Um, when you talk about Harbour Bosch, most people say, oh, isn't that hugely energy consumptive? And the answer to that is, well, sort of. The production of hydrogen to go into Harbour Bosch from steam reforming consumes enormous amounts of energy. But the Harbour Bosch process itself produces heat. So there is really interesting coupling between some of these industrial processes that are going to grow in importance. But if you look across the industry, um, I think it's, it's, it's easy to underestimate the scale of the, um, the energy flows involved. So even relatively small amounts of waste heat, 10, 15% off the back of a chemical plant, is a really substantial amount of heat available for electrolyzers. So go and have a look at the paper. But steel, petrochemical, ammonia, plastics, paper mills, food and drinks, there's a very long list of, uh, 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 that have been comprehensively analysed that demonstrate where that waste heat is in, in our society. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, and my next question, um, I think I'll give to Tony. Um, and um, the question is, um, SOEC is unique versus other electrolysis technologies in being reversible. Uh, in one box. Um, is this something you think your license partners will find interesting? Yeah, if uh, so short answer is absolutely yes. Um, if you look at some of the announcements from them of, of late, um, you take, uh, you know, Doosan, for example, in Korea, uh, is not just talking about fuel cells, but they're talking about an entire hydrogen economy portfolio of solution sets and obviously um, us enabling the same factory that they're licensing for fuel cells uh, under a new license to enable electrolysis stack production and ultimately electrolyzer solution development is extremely exciting and very reinforcing of their strategy um, Bosch Bosch for example is also very very dominant in uh, the hydrogen and fuel cell vector. And so obviously adding another set of applications to what they already have on their license is extremely powerful to them as well and, and has not gone unnoticed. Thanks, Tony. So I've got another question for Mark. Um, how well do you work with supercritical steam, i.e. over 600 centigrade? Uh, okay, good question. So supercritical actually means pressure and steam. So 200 bar and over 300 degrees C. So the question is, how well do we work with steam in generally? We work very well with steam and we can process steam anywhere from 100 degrees up to, up to substantially higher than our operating temperature. When you look at this as, a, as, a, as a, effectively as a vector for process heat is how we tend to look at it. We can consume heat, uh, steam anywhere between 100 degrees uh, and, and 700 degrees quite, quite happily. Thank you, Mark. So um, probably another question for you, Mark. Um, what's the scope of scaling up hydrogen output capacity from the SOEC stack? How big can it go in, in megawatts? Yeah, I mean, it's, scale of production is um, and scale of a single stack are sort of different things is the way we think about them. Key thing for us, it's a, it's a bit like the Ford Model T, you can have any color as long as it's black. A key part of commercialization over the next decade or so is to try and minimize re-engineering for different applications. And therefore, a common stack building block will be the thing we focus on with our licensee partners over the next few years. So that will always be in the uh, 10 kilowatt range, say, for electrolysis, uh, may, maybe 20, but it's, it's that sort of ballpark. And then the question is, can you realistically number up rather than scale up that technology to produce multiple megawatts? And the answer to that is definitely yes. We've chosen a megawatt as a size today because we think that is a minimum viable scale. Um, our first system licensee partners may say, actually, that's great. Or they may say, actually, we want to engineer a 10 or a 20 megawatt node. But I don't think anyone's going to make their first product around this technology 100 megawatts or a gigawatt. But that may be something that happens in the fullness of time. Thanks, Mike. The question, I think this one's probably for John. Um, SOEC will use steam. Is it correct to assume that hydrogen from SOEC um, electrolyzer will often not be green hydrogen because the steam it uses is not produced green? 
Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I, I think it all, yes, it all depends really on on what process you're you're integrating with. Um, but actually, let's let's think about it. So the the, the industrial process where we we're wanting to replace grey hydrogen with with green hydrogen um, is it, it's, it's ne needing that hydrogen to be generated um, by using renewable sources. And then that process is then enabled by green hydrogen. So the process heat, which is coming back around from that, um, will be driven by by the green hydrogen generation process. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, so a question here for Tony. I think uh, Clarissa is still having uh, te technical problems. A um, couple of questions here. How are you going to protect Sarah's IP from from the uh, you know from licensing in China? Yeah. So um, obviously, intellectual property wherever wherever it gets used uh, needs to have the uh, protection required to continue the the use of our licenses and practice our licenses we do that in a number of ways um obviously pa patents and filings occur in china just like anywhere else and that that offers a certain layer of protection uh, i did mention earlier in the in the ip section that trade secrets uh, are kept secret that's that's what they are and that's what they need to be and the secrecy of those trade secrets is, is paramount to, to their protection and we put a lot of practices in place uh, and and checks and balances in place before we reveal trade secrets to any of our licensees under the robust contracts that we put in place. Um, and then, of course, the the long term protection that a company like Sarah's will will, will always have to digest is the continuity of innovation. Um, one of the best ways you will ever protect your IP is to innovate and iterate on your technology faster than anyone else can copy it. And uh, as you saw from our filing trajectory, as you as you heard from Phil earlier, our, our investments in enabling an acceleration of our innovation, um, that's that's one of our strongest guarantees that we will remain differentiated, relevant, and ultimately protected. So uh, ho hopefully that, that, that helps. Thank you, Tony. And I've got one more question for you. Um, when you speak about license fees, are these license fees a one-time event, or do you get license fees from your licensees every year? So our licensing model um, has uh, has some event-driven license fees, which are tend to be what we call our upfront tech transfer payments and license payments. They happen usually pre-commercialization, um, and once that license is being industrialized and commercialized, um, the revenue streams transition to royalty streams. But we do retain in, in, in many circumstances the uh, upgrade fees, which are also event driven, where when we inject new technology um, or next generation technology into our licensees practices, that we also harvest more future event driven royalties. We also do ensure through different contractual mechanisms that the uh, royalty uh, streams perform as per the market application under license. So we, we tend to avoid what we call dormant licenses, where people take a license and it isn't used commercially to generate royalty streams. And we have some uh, commercial and contractual protection to ensure that um, no matter what, some of those royalty streams are payable to Ceres. Thank you, Tony. And there's a follow on question. Um, it, um, it, it relates to, um, you know, the, I'll, I'll say the question, patents last 20 years. How will revenue be generated when the main patent families uh, for the fuel cell and later SOEC expire? Um, are the trade secrets strong enough to maintain revenue? So I, I, I'll take that one. So I, I think Tony's just said this thing about innovation and ongoing. I mean, one, one of the questions we sometimes get asked is, is, is the R&D done? And, and a key part of a licensing business is r and is never done. The technology is ready for commercialization today, but our partners form a long lasting relationship with us. And those, those licenses are really investments in long-term partnerships for us to sustain that R&D, create new patents to inject new technology. So um, if we stopped innovating today, yes, we, 
that we'd expire in 10 to 15 years and there'd be no residual value. But you can see from everything we've talked about today that there is continued investment in innovation across all of the applications. And that's how we sustain that value over time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and thank if you. I can add to that, the, the other thing that I'm not sure everyone understands is that we don't, we don't license the know-how to engineer the solutions. We license the, the result. And so there is a, a competency within Ceres on how to engineer our technology into products that we don't reveal to anyone and that we continue to invest in. So uh, no one should be under the impression that we, we're teaching our customers how to engineer what we do. We don't do that uh, by design. Thank you. So a couple of questions, I think, from Mark, uh, and they're sort of related. Um, what are the key improvements that Ceres is looking to address with its SOEC development versus early, uh, earlier SOEC systems? And secondly, can we assume that Ceres SOEC will achieve a lower efficiency than competing SOECs because it runs at a lower temperature? Okay. Um, sorry, say the first one again. The, se the second, the se short answer to the second part is no. Um, tell me, tell me the first part. Why is why are we differentiated from other SOEC technologies? Okay. So the first, just to clarify, Mark, you're answering that actually we're, we're at the same efficiency as other SOECs, which run at high temperatures. Correct. Yeah. No, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. It was. Um, what are the key improvements we're looking to address um, with SOEC development? Yeah, okay. I mean, in many ways, that's that's very uh, analogous to the progress we've made in our in our fuel cell business. So, just in in the fuel cell business, everyone will have known we've talked about PEM for years, we've talked about alkaline for years, and we've talked about SOFC for years. And within SOFC, there are some real advantages about the ability to work with a whole range of fuels. But our technology is particularly differentiated because the low temperature enables a much lower cost structure within the stack. But because of the lower temperature, and it enables a much lower cost structure within the system. Instead of using super nickel alloys like Inconel, we use ferritic steels. Instead of needing six to eight inches of insulation, we need three inches. So when you look at the whole cost structure of a lower temperature system, it's beneficial to that, to the ultimately to the cost of the end kilogram of hydrogen. And similarly, in SOEC, uh, if you're integrating an engineering system at 600 degrees, um, you end up with that lower cost stack and that lower cost system. In SOEC, there is an additional benefit of that lower temperature. If you if you particularly focus on this uh, this industrial process heat opportunity, uh, and you look at where industrial process heat is in the main, it's actually in that five six hundred degree temperature range. If you look at the temperature Harbour Bosch runs at, it runs at four hundred. If you look at Fisher Trops, maybe it's five hundred. So the opportunities for thermal integration at our lower temperature actually mean we can access much larger proportions of that process heat than other higher temperature technologies that would need that process heat at maybe 800 degrees C. So there's a further virtuous benefit on beyond cost about the ability to consume more heat. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, so um, uh, I have a question. I've actually got a lot of questions here. And um, I'm just trying to, uh, I think we won't have time to answer them all. I think we'll be here till about six o'clock. Um, however, I have a question here, which is um, um, uh, maybe between Mark and Tony, you can decide how, who to answer it. Um, to, to what extent is SOEC a technology suited to using baseload, low carbon electricity input, such as nuclear or geothermal, rather than intermittent renewables, such as wind solar? because of its ability to harness the high quality waste heat, less dynamic response than PEM. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, okay, so um, well, I guess I, I, the first thing is I'd probably attack the premise and then I'll, and then I'll give you a slightly different answer. We haven't said we're not dynamic. We've said we're high efficiency and that's where our primary differentiation comes in. Actually, this is a solid state device and just like we are dynamic in fuel cell mode, we can be very dynamic in electrolysis mode. There's a slightly different question though. If you want to align yourself with uh, industries that consume, produce, process heats and chemicals, they tend to be always on. So the more likely thing is that when we're aligning ourselves with always on industries like, like chemical industries and like 
uh, production of plastics or ammonia or, or e-fuels, that that will drive base load behaviors. So it's not a technology limitation, but we expect it's a market, a, a desirable market attribute that we are always on. Yeah, and just, just a simple addition to that is that um, the differentiation of higher efficiency is rewarded more strongly when you sweat the asset continuously. So um, our differentiation is most noteworthy in low intermittency, but we're not ruling our technology out of intermittent. We just think it provides the largest benefit in the continuous run applications. Yeah, thank you both. Um, I've got a relatively quick question here um, to you, Tony. Um, do we believe that we'll benefit from the EU 2030 um, hydrogen target subsidy program? given the lead times to, to deliver? I, I think the, the biggest benefit that we're going to get is the, the what I call the indirect benefit. So we're not, we, we're, not, we're not a company that typically benefits directly from some of those programs. But if you think about the partners that we have and the potential partners that we will be porting, they will all themselves be benefiting from the, the incentives that are created through these types of programs within the time horizon that they're making decisions to adopt Sarah's technology. So we're, we're, we're making our technology available in the sort of 2025 period as commercial ready. And if you think about that gives about a five year window and a lead time for the various people who will benefit from that program and ultimately select Sarah's technology as the solution set they want to bring forward. So uh, the answer is yes, but probably indirectly, not directly. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question for you, Tony. Um, it, it's it's um, in relation to the uh, the slide I'm showing the demonstrator, uh, the intent to have a demonstrator for next year. Are, are we doing this by ourselves? Are we doing? Are we using partners um, as part of this? And do we have any partners lined up for SOEC? So um, <clears throat> we are lining up several partners and in discussions with several partners as Deepak suggested in his presentation. And this first of a kind that, that John Harmon described is initially something we're, we're self-investing in, but we are offering the partners who are expressing interest today um, visibility to it and an opportunity to participate, not necessarily in all the engineering of it, but we do believe that the best proof point is with a partner who knows what they're looking at and knows how to use an asset of this nature. And so we think that in the foreseeable future, it makes a lot of sense for Ceres to find a suitable partner to work alongside us on this first of a kind demonstrator to ensure that it has maximum commercial value in one or many of the applications that we, we, we think it deserves. So uh, more to come on that, I obviously can't preview any of those types of announcements. But uh, the answer is yes, we tend to couple commercial interest with our technology pursuits to make sure that they're of maximum relevance to, to the marketplace that we're pursuing. Yeah, thank you, Tony. And a question from Mark, I think. Um, I hear steam is bad for metal-based SOEC. Is corrosion a problem? Um, what data do you have on it? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I think one of the things that we, we, we talked about during the presentation, if I just compare fuel cells and electrolysis, I think that's probably the easiest way to do it. If I take a, a cell like that, I'm sorry, without the post-it notes, a cell like that, at one end, we put air and fuel in, and at the other end, in fuel cell mode, we generate steam. So these technologies, which we have many tens of, many hundreds of thousands of hours of hundreds of specimens around the world generating durability data with our partners are operating in extremely similar steam rich environments. So um, there are lots of things I could point to in the world that are engineered to combine stainless steel and steam routinely without corrosion problems. So is a steel cell fundamentally limited by its association with steam? No, it's, it's absolutely its bread and butter in fuel cell mode and it will be its bread and butter in electrolysis mode. Thank you, Mark. I've got a couple of questions which I'll try and answer myself. 
um, you say you'll invest 100 million over the next five years in SOEC. You know, what would you do with this? Um, is it all to set up a demo plant? So I, th I think the context here is, um, you know, broadly, um, uh, you know, a, a big part of this or a significant, uh, significant minority part is going to be setting up the demonstrator or demonstrators. Um, however, in setting, what, we, what you've got to think of is that we're setting up a whole new business um, in parallel to our existing one. And although there are many parallels, um, there is infrastructure that needs to be put in place and there are people that we need to, to bring in place in order to grow this business. In the context, I look at this um, 100 million or so um, that we look to invest in SOEC is the revenue opportunity and the value to the to the company. Um, and again, what I see is a multi 100 million revenue opportunity uh, in SOEC. Um, in uh, I think we and one second, I'll just find another question. We have a, a time only for a few more, I think. Um, There's a question on royalties. Um, maybe Tony, you can answer this. Uh, when you speak of royalties, is it correct to assume the royalties are only paid to Ceres when the electrolyzer is built? So for every electrolyzer, you get a one-time royalty, or do you get royalties every year the electrolyzer is running? So a <clears throat> couple, couple of uh, answers to that. So first of all, the stacks that go into the electrolyzer will follow very much the same royalty stream, we believe, as the fuel cell mode. In other words, the factories will pay on, on a per unit stack basis a royalty fee to Ceres. Now, you have to remember that that's not just a one-time event because there's, these assets have a, a long lifespan and uh, o over some interval period, um, there will be some serviceable stacks that will also generate incremental royalties even though the, the asset has remained the same. On the <clears throat> electrolyzer system around the stacks, um, we're exploring a couple of models depending on, on the customer. We have some flexibility around that. Um, and depending on the partner's appetite to pay more front or, or defer, there could be opportunity to um, incorporate a royalty stream into the kilogram of hydrogen produced if, if there's a flow through of that mechanism back to Ceres. Um, or there might be just the interest in paying a bit more up front for a, a single event. Those types of terms only ultimately get defined when, when, when we define the license itself and put it under contract. So I'm not going to corner Sarah's into describing a, a, a single mechanism because we don't need to at this stage. I think um, it depends a little bit on the application, depends on the business that our, our partners are in. And frankly, it depends a little bit on the way they extract revenue um, from the application. And we can sometimes piggyback on the manner in which they extract value and uh, and align our interests in that way. Thanks, Tony. And I've got another question for you here. Um, uh, it's part of a long list of questions, but I, I think we've only got time for this one of, of this particular person who's asked it. Um, uh, we've, we've got, you've made reference to Bosch and Dusan intending to build plants in 2024. Um, would these plants be able to produce SOEC, um, not just SOFC? So the answer is, is yes. Um, they, they don't have a license to do that at the moment. So um, there, there would be a requirement for each, each of them to procure a license to produce SOEC stacks um, as additional revenue streams for, for their relevant factories. On the technical side, though, the equipment that's in place and the factory itself will be tooled up to make SOEC stacks at that point in time because we don't believe the SOEC stack is fundamentally different in its processing equipment to the SOFC stacks that will be that will be produced at that time. And so um, whilst there might be some slight differentiation in, in design that we introduce, we don't believe that the SOFC stack factories will be unable to produce SOEC stacks in the future and therefore that capacity could very easily be used to produce SOE st SOEC stacks under under an, a, a new license from Ceres. Thank you Tony. So I've just got a we've only got time I think for a couple more questions and um, I think for those questions that were unable to answer 
uh, live now. We'll try to answer them uh, um, later. Um, uh, this is probably a question for you, uh, John. Um, is Ceres developing the whole system in-house, including the balance of plant? Are you using external suppliers? Um, what's happening? So we're, we're developing the concept, the basic concept of the electrolyzer system in-house, um, but we are working with industrial partners who are then going through and doing the detailed design of, of the system. Um, so, um, so yeah, we, again, you know, around, that's around our, our normal model where we'll, we'll develop the core technology, we'll develop the system IP, and then we'll work with other suppliers who've got those capabilities that we can, we can lean upon. Um, so we're not, we're not investing in, in, um, um, large electrolyzer production facilities at Ceres. Thank you, John. Uh, and I've got one which I think I'll try and answer myself is which, what percentage of revenues in the future do you imagine might derive from SOEC versus SOFC? And I think probably refer back to the, the slide that we showed um, schematically, which showed that currently, um, you know, we're, 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 we, we've got, uh, you know, all of our revenue streams from SOFC and we expect that royalties will come on top of these revenues uh, um, as and when our partners go to market. Um, I, I think looking longer term, you know, we can see, I think as we've stated, that SOEC is a market at least the size of the SOFC opportunity. So um, if you're thinking like that, then, you know, we can definitely see that going forward into the, into the midterm, um, we can see that you've got very similar, um, similar revenue streams if, if you look out beyond 2030. Um, and I, I think we may have to call it the day there. Um, you know, we've, uh, um, there's been a tremendous number of questions and interest, and we're extremely grateful for these. And I hope I've answered um, those that are, that are most relevant. There's a lot I haven't managed to, um, but as I said, we'll try and do that. So my fi finally, I'll just say thank you very much for the team for presenting. Great presentation. I hope everyone found it very interesting. Um, and if you have further questions, please do ask our IR team um, and on that note, thank you very much. Fantastic, Richard. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to the Cirrus Power team indeed for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session? You should be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Cirrus Power's holding, thank you very much for attending today. <laughs>